Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. We now turn to looking at young star systems in super short X-ray wavelengths using the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Researchers have long known that young stars can emit powerful flares that can clear their surroundings of lighter material. Exactly how common these kinds of events actually are has been a mystery. So this team watched and counted. Specifically, they watched 24,000 stars under 5 million years old in 40 different regions of the sky. They caught over a thousand stars giving off flares that are vastly more powerful than anything we've seen in our uh, more adult-aged sun. The stellar toddlers they watched were caught giving off flares a hundred thousand to, in a few instances, ten million times more energetic than our sun's flares. The smaller flares are weak, weekly occurrences for the young stars with about two mega flares occurring each year. According to a release from Chandra, scientists have argued that these giant flares can help give planets to still forming stars by driving gas away from disks of material that surround them. This can trigger the formation of pebbles and other small rocky material that is a crucial step for planets to form. On the other hand, these flares may take away from planets that have already formed by blasting any atmospheres with powerful radiation, possibly resulting in their complete evaporation and destruction in less than 5 million years. Exactly how common these X-ray flashes help and hinder? Well, that's going to require future study. From things you look at in infrared to things we see in x-rays, we now turn to things we don't see at all, dark matter. Back in 2018, scientists spotted a galaxy with stellar motions consistent with that galaxy not really having the invisible dark matter we thought was omnipresent in galaxies. Nicknamed DF2, this system is a giant blob of ancient stars. How you can get a galaxy without dark matter is not something scientists can answer. Heck, we thought galaxies formed in the large halos of dark matter that pulled in the luminous matter. But when researchers added up all the observed light from the system and measured all the motions, the observed stars were all that was needed to explain the observed motions. Now, there is one variable that goes into these calculations that is pretty important. You have to know what distance you have to the galaxy so that you can calculate how big the stars are that are actually based on that distance and how bright they appear. In 2018, a distance of 65 million light years was used based on a variety of distance calculations. If this estimate was just 30% off and the galaxy was more like 42 million light years away, then it would have a normal amount of dark matter and all would be right with science. To try and confirm the distance, a team led by Zili Shen re-examined this system and used 40 orbits of the Hubble Space Telescope to get highly precise observations of individual stars. These measurements, they revealed with improved accuracy that DF2 is not where scientists thought. It is actually farther away. The system is located 72 million light years away. According to collaborator Peter von Dalkum, Hubble really shows the entire thing. That's it. It's not just the tip of the iceberg. It's the whole iceberg. Somehow, there really is a galaxy with no dark matter. Theorists, it's, it's your turn. After the break, we're going to be talking about distant icy worlds in our own solar system, and then we'll turn to discussing the Hubble Space Station, the telescope required for this story. It's, um, it's not working, folks, and this is a bad day for science. Stay tuned. When it comes to understanding planetary formation and system evolution, until recently, we had a sample set of one. Our own solar system was the only one we could look at and analyze. Now we have thousands to look at in all stages of formation and evolution, from the protoplanetary disk we talked about earlier to thousands upon thousands of exoplanets found with Kepler and Tess. And still, 
as our ground-based observ observatories continue to improve and as we continue to use the Hubble Space Telescope for more local observations, we learn something new about our own system nearly every week, it seems. I know it's still a bit of a controversy, but these improved observatories are what led to the demotion of Pluto to dwarf planet status. Pluto turned out to not be the only object out beyond Neptune. Soon there were Eris and Makemake and Haumea and a whole host of other bodies. Their orbits are just as eccentric as Pluto's, and they changed our view of the Kuiper Belt. We generally group them all together as Kuiper Belt objects or as trans-Neptunian objects, these distant icy worlds that erratically orbit past our ice giants. And they are always spoken of as one group. Now it turns out that may not be the case. In new research published in the Astronomical Journal and led by Mohammed Ali Deeb from NYU Abu Dhabi, scientists have divided these trans-Neptunian objects into two distinct groups, and they did it with data we already had. Using a 2019 data set, the team analyzed the chemical composition of the trans-Neptunian objects to understand how the Kuiper Belt has changed over time. What they found showed that the two distinct colors of trans-Neptunian objects very red and less red, which I have also seen referred to as gray or blue, actually link back to separate orbital patterns. Add in some math and these orbital patterns lead back to different locations. So our two groups of trans-Neptunian objects formed in different places, possibly from two separate larger bodies. This is the first study to combine the factors of both color and orbit of these trans-Neptunian objects. Since these tiny icy worlds are considered fossils from the early days of the solar system, understanding these two new groupings gives us another piece of information about our system's evolution. After the break, we'll talk about this pressing concern that our precious workhorse of a telescope, Hubble, isn't working. Back when I was in the 10th grade, the space shuttle Discovery carried one of the first great observatories into orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope. And we quickly learned that the telescope had issues. Built in the 80s and delayed in launch by the Challenger accident in 1986, this telescope was already carrying an old computer when it launched. It was also carrying a flawed mirror but we figured out how to fix that with corrective lenses. So no big deal. The scope entered its prime my second year of university with the first Hubble servicing mission. And for my entire professional life, I've benefited from the data this spectacular piece of engineering has been able to send back. And we've gotten to benefit from this telescope far longer than anyone ever expected. Hubble was designed to fit into the space shuttle cargo bay and to be flown back and forth from space for regular servicing. After the Challenger accident, that was deemed unsafe. And after Columbia was lost at the beginning of this century, NASA didn't really want to even send a space shuttle up as high as Hubble's orbit. The plan was, as soon as JWST was up and operating, HST would retire knowing its legacy of science had safely passed to a new set of mirrors. JWST kind of missed its 2007 launch plan and its 2010 launch plan. And it's 2021 and JWST is still on the ground. To allow HST to keep working, engineers at the Space Telescope Science Institute had to figure out how to time and time again update the Hubble without bringing it home. And then everyone, including folks like you, had to petition and plead for one final mission to give it new life before the space shuttle program was retired. Back in May 2009, we got that last servicing mission, and it was hoped we'd get a few more years of science, and more than a decade later, we are continuing to do great science with Hubble. But on Sunday, Hubble shut itself down when an error occurred in one of its original circa 1980s computers. As the Voyager missions have proven, NASA computers are a lot more reliable than your average laptop, 
But at 30, heck, didn't we all start feeling a little bit more tired at 30? Engineers are in communications with the spacecraft and the problem seems to be a degraded memory module. And attempts are being made to switch over to a backup module. According to the NASA Goddard operations team, Assuming that this problem is corrected via one of the many options available to the operations team, Hubble is expected to continue yielding amazing discoveries into the late 2020s or beyond. I'm glad that this statement seems to indicate there are no longer plans to retire HST as soon as JWST is orbiting. Unless, of course, they are hinting JWST won't launch until the late 2020s, but I don't think that's what they're hinting at. The team went on to add, there is no definitive timeline yet as to when this will be completed, tested, and brought back to operational status. We here at The Daily Space would like to wish the team Godspeed in getting HST operational again. We are not yet ready for Hubble to pass into the long, dark void. After the break, we'll be back to review the scientific MacGuffin of Brandon Sanderson's dystopian sci-fi series, Skyward. So we sometimes get to bring you reviews of books and movies and the science therein. And we have a really weird case today of the science being right in a fantasy book in a situation where you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be right. According to Alfred Hitchcock, Every good story is allowed at least one MacGuffin. This is that thing that just has to have happened in, our, in order to motivate the story forward. In The Martian, it was the windstorm that destroyed so many different things on Mars, even though such a windstorm really couldn't happen. Over and over in fiction, we see these kinds of, well, if this one little thing hadn't happened, nothing would have happened. And often this is that thing that gets used in science fiction to say, we're just going to break all the rules of physics right here. We're going to make something happen and thus the story shall continue. Well, in Brandon Sanderson's Psionics series, which includes book one, Skyward, and book two, Star Sight, with book three coming out in November. The MacGuffin is that there are refugees of human civilization hiding in the caves of a world that is surrounded by a falling debris disk of the satellites of prior generations. They are trapped there as prisoners to alien races. And the MacGuffin that keeps everything going is that there is this debris above them that doesn't even generally allow them to see the stars. Because at each and every orbital height, there is debris field after debris field overlapping and moving and blocking access to the sky. And they get attacked when chunks of stuff fall out of the sky. All of this comes to be told in the first couple paragraphs, pages of the story, no spoilers here. But I want to look at that MacGuffin, that orbiting debris field, and ask, could this happen? And the answer is yes. There, there is no destruction of science in what is going on here. If you fill the orbits above our planet with satellite after satellite, big and bigger space stations and construction platforms and orbiting science labs and docking stations and landing bays, all of this massive equipment, if broken and beaten through collisions and battles, it will fragment. And each of those fragments will have some new random element to its velocity, and they will scatter. 
until all reality is nothing but carnage. This is something we have to worry about with geosynchronous orbit where, where we are constantly launching new missions over and over and have to carefully negotiate who gets what piece of space. And this is an orbit orbital issue in low Earth orbit where launches sometimes have to be delayed to not hit things. This could be our future people. Well, except for the aliens holding us prisoner on our own planet, we hope. But that MacGuffin of a debris disk blocking the stars? We can prevent that from happening. We can avoid Brandon Sanderson's horrible dystopian future for people if we just work together. So all of you satellite operators out there, work together, avoid this future. And folks, this is an excellent set of stories. There's a lot of fantasy involved, a bit of magic, but you'll enjoy it. So check it out, add it to your summer reading list. We highly recommend taking on these two books before the third one comes out in November. Start now and you'll have time to be done. That's all. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including these images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations and contributions of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash cosmoquestx.